Good morning and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm so glad to see all of you at this morning's conference. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about it. Um, this year's uh, um, Middle East Institute's annual conference will attempt to tackle the most intractable question trailing from the Arab uprisings, and that's the ongoing social and humanitarian disaster in Syria. In the early 1980s, a BBC journalist reporting from Damascus spoke favorably about the standards of living enjoyed by the majority of Syrians relative to those in countries with similar levels of development. Since then, Syria has undergone a process of lumpen development. Just prior to the uprising in 2011, data from the Syrian Central Bureau of Statistics indicated that an average Syrian household could barely afford the costs of a decent living standard. Together with the precarious hold of the regime's ideology on the state, these changes in living conditions culminated in popular revolts that instantaneously turned into armed conflict over the past few years. What's more, this conflict has drawn in major regional and international powers that is now on the ground in Syria, Turkish, Iranian, American and Russian forces and other militants from around the globe. The chessboard of global imbalances and contradictions appears to be instantiated on the Syrian stage. This chaos has caught the attention of many media outlets, adding to the topical nature of the conflict. But as we all know, topical alone doesn't contribute to knowledge as such. The advancement of knowledge lies not in a superficial reading of the news. It's about probing the underlying social trends setting on course the one outcome or the other. And this conference was designed with that purpose in mind. We've thus assembled, well, not me, but I, I really must acknowledge uh, both Dr. Linda Mata and Professor Peter Sluglet, because they have worked tirelessly to assemble an impressive group of scholars from all over the world. And all of those of you who have made the journey out to Singapore, I welcome you. We look forward to hearing your, your discussions and what you have to say on the panels that run um, through today and to tomorrow. Um, for, the, for our wider audience, let me say that the scholars that we've invited have dedicated their time to, starring, to studying Syria from different disciplines, and I am really quite sure that our contribution to knowledge will be significant. Today's speakers will focus on the contemporary history, economics, society and politics of Syria. Tomorrow, the speakers will tackle questions of religion, food security, and last but not least, the critical humanitarian crisis unfolding from the ongoing Syrian crisis. I'd like now to introduce a leading scholar on Syria, Professor Raymond Hennebush. He's a professor of international relations and Middle East politics at the University of St. Andrews. He's also founder and director of the Center for Syrian Studies. His major works, and I, it's a long, long list, and we are so honored to have him here today. So let me just uh, highlight a few of his, of his works. Uh, I hope you don't mind that. <laughs> um, his major works include Egyptian politics under Sadat, the international politics of the Middle East, and Syria, revolution from above. He's co-edited the foreign policies of Middle East states, um, Turkey-Syria relations between enmity and amity, sovereignty after empire, comparing the Middle East and Central Asia, the Iraq war causes and consequences, and Syria, from reform to revolt, politics and international relations. Professor Hannah Bush's current interests focus on state formation and conflict in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings. Specifically, he's working with Dr. Morton Valbion at Aarhus University on the project Sectarianism in the Wake of the Arab Re Revolts. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker this morning. Um, and I welcome you to ask him any questions after, the, after he's delivered his speech. Professor Hannah Bush. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to the conference organizers, to, to Ms. Teo, Professor Sluglet, Dr. Matar. Um, it's an honor to be asked to address this impressive group, a bit daunting because uh, I see as I look out uh, across all your faces that there are many people here that know as much or perhaps more about Syria than I do. So appropriately, I'm not going to attempt anything terribly ambitious but rather, 
what I will try to do is, is to, to survey what I think we know about what went wrong and why uh, in Syria. Uh, the, the Syrian uprising uh, raises all sorts of puzzles and theoretical issues which uh, have bearing on several bodies of work in politics and IR, for example, authoritarian resilience, democratization, nonviolent resistance, social movement theory, sectarianization, new wars, civil wars, all of these bodies of work have some relation to uh, what we're experiencing in Syria, and they help us perhaps to understand Syria, and the Syrian case throws perhaps some light on these bodies of work. So I'll highlight uh, some of these uh, different theoretical approaches by way of addressing the question of what went wrong in Syria. And actually, we're talking about several questions. So the first question I'll start with, why was the Assad regime so vulnerable to the uprising? When, when Assad came to power, uh, there were hopes of political and economic reform in Syria. Not only did those reforms not materialize, but Bashar's effort to initiate them inadvertently weakened his regime and paved the way for uh, the uprising. To understand this, we, we need, it seems to me, to locate Syria as a case of the region-wide movement from populist versions of authoritarianism to post-populist ones. It, it is also a case of so-called authoritarian upgrading by which populist regimes tried to compensate for the loss of their popular constituencies as they moved into the post-populist stage and also tried to adapt to the global hegemony of ne neoliberal capitalism. Now, it seems to me most observers did not expect the Arab Spring to spread to Syria because authoritarian upgrading seemed to be working. There was a young president with a nationalist image. New support had been co-opted to make or to compensate for those being excluded there was the inclusion of new business actors, returning expatriates, lots of Gulf investment coming in. There was a discourse on modernization, a new life of consumption in the big cities for those that could afford it, and the exclusion of the popular sectors was recent and far less advanced than, for example, in, in Egypt, where it had been going on for some decades. There was also the kind of what one might call the negative demonstration effect of civil war in Iraq, arguably an outcome of attempted American imposed democratization. So this was a, this was a warning of what could go wrong uh, if there was an effort to push things too far in Syria. And uh, Syria, as compared to many of the other Arab states, was less penetrated by foreign NGOs and Western influence. So for all of these reasons, it looked like uh, authoritarian upgrading was working in Syria, yet uh, we know now, of course, that for every problem fixed by authoritarian upgrading, there were negative side effects that produced all sorts of new vulnerabilities. So that the outcome, after 10 years of Bashar's rule, was a country which was, in fact, quite vulnerable to uprising. In some respects, party rule had been replaced by family and sectarian rule. Crony capitalism, symbolized by Rami Makhlouf, was widely resented. There was the shrinking of the regime's social base by the fact that it was abandoning the former populist social contract. And specifically important, I think, was the regime's neglect of its former peasant rural constituency. This neglect abandonment, if you will, of the regime's former rural constituency was happening at a time when inexorable population growth on fixed land resources was leaving the sons of land reform presence who would have been supporters of the regime, was leaving these sons landless and forced on the job market. On top of this, in the countryside, there had been a drought of unprecedented severity and length, and the spread into the countryside gradually, over at least a decade, of Islamist discourse, which made all of these factors together, the rural areas, the small towns, the suburbs, hotbeds of discontent, which would be mobilized in the uprising. Okay, second question. 
Why and how did people mobilize against the regime? Grievances might have been high among the many who were disadvantaged by post-populism, but the collective action problem seemed insurmountable. Civil society seemed to be too controlled and atomized to be a vehicle of mobilization. People knew the security forces were loyal and would not hesitate to use unrestrained violence, what Friedman called Hama rules. Why risk your life? Rational actors would free ride, especially since in authoritarian states, when you oppose the government, you can't know how many people are with you because people don't honestly describe or, or, or uh, make known their wishes. So better not to expose yourself. Yet all of these apparent deterrents against mobilization were overcome. There was, it seems, a certain loss of fear among the generation that had not experienced Tama, the younger people. Then there was the demonstration effect of the other uprisings where the army had turned against press presidents. And there was, one might, one might uh, call it, uh, a certain wishful thinking uh, that Syria was not that different from these other Arab countries. And so the uprising that had succeeded there could succeed in Syria. People often make inaccurate analogies, and this was probably a case of that. There was also uh, the role, of course, of the social media, very important in overcoming atomization, particularly among the educated youth, and the social media spreading a narrative of national uprising. And finally, one might uh, also suggest that, particularly in the rural areas and suburbs where the uprising started, the role of tribal ties was important in overcoming atomization. So that gives us, it seems to me, some insights into why, against all expectations, you had anti-regime mobilization. But then the next question, it seems to me, is why did the peaceful protest not lead to democratic transition? There was, arguably, enough mobilization to lead to democratic transition under the right circumstances, and there are two theoretical approaches which suggest how that might have happened. There is the nonviolent resistance paradigm. Certainly, mobilization levels in Syria were quite enough in the thinking of the non-resistance, the, the, non, the, 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 the peaceful civil resistance paradigm. There was, there was certainly enough mobilization to force democratization on the regime. And in this paradigm, the thinking was that the regime's use of violence would just inflame the opposition would spur defections from the security forces, possibly spur foreign intervention. This, was a, this is a scenario under the, the nonviolent resistance paradigm by which the uprisings might have led to democratization, or it's one, one scenario. Of course, as we know, um, the opposition was inflamed by the use of violence by the regime, but defections of the security forces Abandoning of the president did not happen, arguably deterred by the intimate shared interests and sectarian affiliations which bound together the political and military elites tightly in Syria. By contrast, for example, to Tunisia and Egypt, where presidential families and the military command had been at odds. The second way in which um, a transition to democracy can be theorized is the notion of pacted transition. This is a scenario in which softliners marginalize the hardliners on both sides and combine to engineer a transition to democracy. In Syria, we saw the opposite outcome. Softliners on both sides were pushed aside by the hardliners. On the one hand, Bashar aligned with the hardline security chiefs so the hardliners were in charge in the regime. On the other hand, there was no credible moderate opposition able to bargain with the regime for a transition because the moderates had lost the support of the revolutionary youth who wanted regime change from below. Of course, the question uh, that goes begging is what if Bashar uh, had led the softliners? instead of the hardliners. Many think 
agency would have mattered. The outcome could have been different. He could have, some suggest, even won a free election and led the process of reform, so you'd have had democratic transition instead of civil war. Why did he not? Uh, one explanation might have to do with perceptions. Evidently, there was a perception that making concessions is what had led to the fall of presidents in Egypt and Tunisia, so don't make any concessions. But one might ask, well, why did Bashar learn that lesson, that making concessions uh, is a bad thing? Why didn't he learn the lesson from Libya that using violence only inflames opposition? It could be uh, that the explanation for why Bashar didn't lead the softliners has to do with the regime composition. The toxic composition of sect and crony capitalism on which his regime had come to be based, one might argue was structurally incompatible with a liberal transition. The argument would be, first of all, Bashar had debilitated the Ba'ath Party's potential capacity to deliver voting support across sects uh, in, in, in cases uh, had there been competitive elections. The, the Ba'ath Party machine that would have had to deliver votes for the regime had been debilitated. Uh, and so that if you democratized, the risk was powerful that you would empower Sunni politicians uh, at uh, the expense of disempowering the Alawi core uh, and base of the regime. There was also uh, the fact that a full transition to the market uh, would threaten the crony capitalists' ability to enrich themselves through insider monopolies. And also, arguably, democratization would empower the disadvantaged masses, those people who were suffering from the move, the move towards neoliberalism. It would give them the capacity to attack the policies that were constituting crony capitalism. So there could be structural reasons why it was never in the cards that, that Bashar al-Assad would lead reform. We don't know. Well, of course, what we do know, we do know is that democratization failed. Once democratization failed, the next question it seems to me that we need to pose is why did anti-regime mass mobilization not lead to revolution from below? Why did it lead instead uh, to stalemate? At the beginning of 2012, in fact, there were lots of outsiders that thought the regime was on the ropes, but they were wrong. Why? Why did you not get mass revolution from below? Arguably, mass revolution from below would have required cross-class coalition bandwagoning against the regime, something that we saw in Egypt and Tunisia, where much of the middle and lower classes come together. Nobody seems to be standing with the regime. Everyone's against it. Uh, and so there's nobody to fight for presidents. They have no choice but, but to depart. Now, to get that scenario, you have to have special combination, very high levels of grievances, but also high opportunity structure to mobilize. What we see, it seems to me, in, in Syria is that anti-regime mobilization was significant, but it was diluted by cross-cutting cleavages. Class was cross-cut by communal cleavages, by urban-rural cleavages. Therefore, mobilization was diluted on both class and communal grounds. Mobilization against the regime was diluted. So you find, for example, that not only the minorities, but much of the Sunni urban upper middle class refrained from bandwagoning against the regime. So the lesson appears to be that there were enough grievances and enough of an opportunity structure to produce an uprising, significant mobilization, but not enough to lead to the revolutionary overthrow of the regime. Because significant parts of the population either stood with the regime or refrained from mobilizing against it. Okay, why, it seems to me the next question, why 
democratic transition fails, revolution from below fails. Why did what started as peaceful mass protest turn into armed civil war framed in sectarian terms? Why did it go so badly wrong? As we all know, the initial protests were peaceful, but of course, um, the use of violence by the regime stimulated counter-arming, counter-violence by the opposition. And therefore, gradually you get the militarization of the conflict. Important aspect of this is there were enough defections from the army to fuel the construction of what later came to be called the Free Syrian Army. And the Free Syrian Army enjoyed external safe havens, particularly, uh, of course, in Turkey. It also enjoyed arms from outside. And particularly important uh, was, I think, the flow of anti-tank weapons from outside uh, armors to uh, the, milit the militant opposition. And therefore, uh, what you got before long, of course, was a territorial division of the country. The armed opposition was strong enough not to overthrow the regime's army, not strong enough to do that, but it was strong enough uh, to wrest broad swathes of territory from the control of the regime. Therefore, entrancing a situation where you have battle lines, which over a number of years are fluctuating back and forth, but at, at the end of the day, you seem to have a situation where they don't change decisively. As for the parallel sectarianization of the conflict, why did that happen? Of course, um, the beginning of the process was the instrumentalization of sectarianism by the regime, by which it tried to mobilize its core support. The opposition followed suit, also instrumentalizing sectarianization. So at the beginning of the process of sectarianization, it's elites and counter-elites exploiting or using the sectarian card. But with time, this seeps down to the grassroots level. It takes on a life of its own. And in this regard, uh, it seems to me, one can see at the grassroots a certain identity change taking place because of the violence of the conflict, because of the mobilization of the rural underclasses, you have an embrace of Salafism and jihadist versions of Salafism. So identity change, substantial identity change, a substantial sectarianization of people's way uh, of thinking. Added to that, state failure. That is the breakdown of order, sectarian massacres in a few places, creates what is usually called the security dilemma. That's a situation where people insecure all depend for protection on their communal group. The so solidarity of the communal group is reinforced by this security dilemma, this rampant uh, insecurity. And people um, look to purify their communities of the other. They arm themselves to defend their communities against the other. And so one sees that taking place and reinforcing the grassroots sectarianization. And then, of course, reinforcing this, the intervention in the Syrian conflict of non-state movements with sectarian uh, characteristics. We have the phenomenon where external forces back the most militant jihadists because they are thought to be the best fighters. And then also you have the exit or marginalization of the moderates of the secular middle class leaving the field to those who are mobilizing and thinking along sectarian lines. So what started as an uprising that had 
a sort of cross-sectarian character in which the discourse was a civil state, inclusion of everybody in the hoped for democratic alter uh, state that would, uh, that would result from the uprising. Uh, this sort of discourse is pretty much mar marginalized and people are now thinking in, in sectarian terms. The next question, it seems to me, is why has the conflict proved to be so intractable in spite of the fact that arguably there has existed for a number of years now what could be called a hurting stalemate in which neither side can hope for victory and everybody is suffering costs. And yet the conflict continues. It remains intractable. How do we explain that? I think one could uh, understand this by thinking of, of Syria as, as, as a case of, of Mary Calder's new wars. And the features of new wars is their intractability. A number of the features that, that uh, she identifies as characteristic of what she calls new wars can be found in the Syrian case. The Syrian conflict, of course, is no longer just about Syria. It has become the site of broader trans-state identity wars, Sunni versus Shia. That's characteristic of new wars, that, uh, that uh, they are often identity wars that go beyond borders uh, of particular states. Another characteristic uh, of new wars is the blurring of the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. This distinction breaks down, so you have massive deaths among civilians. This creates enormous animosities to the point where no side could imagine continued coexistence with the other. So that certainly is part of the dynamic of why it's so intractable. Then there's the war economy. As the normal economy collapsed, People have to find a way to survive. They, they seek to survive through spoils, uh, through competition for the spoils of war, or they join militant groups who have access to generous external funding. And uh, you get a dynamic where people that we might call warlords um, have a stake in the continuance of the conflict. They profit from it. And many other people f have no option but to continue uh, to attach themselves to one warlord or, or another. Then, of course, uh, there is the dynamic of the external backers. On both sides, you have states who are providing their Syrian clients with enough support to keep fighting, but not enough to defeat their opponents. So the stalemate goes on, intractable. Then there is what might be called the commitment problem. If there were going to be a resolution, you'd have to have a certain amount of trust on both sides between the regime and the opposition. This is the commitment problem. Neither side can trust the other to keep any agreements that might be reached because of the sense of animosity, the intense animosity between the two sides. There is the belief, of course, that the government, the regime, would never keep its word. As regards the opposition, uh, it is so fragmented that one could not identify a single leadership that could deliver the opposition into any agreement that might be reached. And finally, of course, uh, there is the fact that there are too many spoilers or veto players who have no interest in a settlement. Too many of these spoilers, both inside and outside. So um, a particularly intractable case, unfortunately. The final issue uh, I wanted to say a few words about is what has the outcome been? What, have, what has the consequence been at this point of uh, four years of civil war for, for governance uh, yeah, in Syria? What we have uh, arguably going on is what might be called competitive regime formation in which in the Syrian space you have a number of attempts including those of the Assad regime and various elements of the opposition uh, competing to create regimes in this space 
which would um, arguably uh, prevail one over the other. If one looks uh, at the Assad regime, what we see is that in order to survive what's become a sectarian civil war, it has reconfigured itself into a much more coercive and exclusive brand of neo-patrimonialism, but also a more decentralized version of neo-patrimonialism. Because as the regular army and the bureaucracies, the instruments of the state have in some ways been hollowed out and their command posts have become uh, less reliable, what we find is, is that the regime has diffused power downward uh, to militias at the local level in neighborhoods often communally cleansed neighborhoods armed for self-defense. So the regime looks different than it did before the uprising. In the opposition-controlled territories, what do we find? Well, there the most robust counter-regime builders are, of course, the Salafist jihadist movements such as Jabhat al-Nusra, Ahrar al-Sham, ISIS. Here we find charismatic leaders with radical Islamist ideologies, leading armed movements with some bureaucratic capabilities, often centered on Sharia courts. These movements, these um, jihadist movements, vary a bit uh, according to how far their goal is a trans-state caliphate or rather whether they only aim at the Islamization of the Syrian state. But other than these differences, I, I think it's fair to say that all of these jihadist movements are like the regime exclusivist. They're exclusionary of all those that do not hold to their fundamentalist version of Islam. So the outcome of governance seems to be two actors, two powerful actors, which are ex largely exclusionary. They include only those who accept their definition of identity and uh, the proper sort of order. Well, what about the civic activists who launched the uprising? Um, the evidence seems to be that they have been squeezed, squeezed between the regime and the jihadists. There are remnants of what used to be the local coordinating council activists grouped with armed elements, surviving elements of the Free Syrian Army, and traditional notables, often governing through elected councils in particular areas. But this governance is highly fragmented, and in many areas, uh, it seems it has increasingly been marginalized by warlords, by the jihadists, or targeted by regime bombing and food sieges whereby the regime tries to make sure that no alternative attractive form of governance can emerge uh, to compete with it. So um, is there any way out of this? Well, that's beyond my remit and uh, I'm going to stop at this point. So thank you very much.